All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, okay. Getting... I am... Yes, I, yes, they did tell me I wasn't allowed to walk around. That disappoints me because I'd rather see you closer, um, see your faces closer. Um, so, Saul, if you want to hit the slides, um, I want to first start with a little bit about my um, background to give you some context of why I'm speaking to you today. It's not just because of my counterterrorism experience. It's because I'm a, a believer as well. Um, I was raised in Dallas, Texas, um, and attended a private Christian school there. I was raised in non-denominational churches, think Dallas Theological Seminary vibe. Uh, I went to school at UT Austin, and uh, that's actually when I got involved with a PCA church, RUF ministry. Then I moved to D.C. for a bit, um, uh, for 10 years, not a bit. Uh, met my husband, and his job kind of moved us around the country. So we ended up in six different cities, five states over 15 years. And we were in a lot of different churches, SBC, PCA, non-denominational, Anglican, Acts 29. We've done it all, right? Um, so I kind of consider myself an evangelical mutt. Um, but I do think that God used that to help me build resilience, uh, build resilience to some of the factors that have taken hold of our community in the last 10 years. Um, and we'll talk about some of those factors in the next minute. Uh, Saul, will you go to the next slide? So we're going to spend 30 minutes together on a range of topics. My goal is to equip you with an understanding of the dangers of polarization, how it leads you, leads to increased acts of violence and results in a downward cycle, a decline of society as a whole. We're going to look at what extremism is, how individuals radicalize to extremism, and how we can leverage evidence around why people radicalize to intervene with them, to disrupt. The radicalization process before someone crosses into a criminal threshold. Then we're going to look at what the church can do to help prevent extremism or intervene with those on the pathway to radicalization. And I'm just going to be straight with you. This is a lot of material. Um, there is so much more to explore. Uh, in fact, I wrote an entire book about it. Actually, I probably wrote two books because my editor cut my book in half when I turned in the original manuscript. So um, we're can, we have breakout sessions and we can dive into some of these topics or other aspects of the topic. Um, and also I hope we can stay in touch. Um, you'll see at the end, I have a, a website where I'm trying to generate some conversation around um, these challenges and what we can do to bring peace to our communities. Um, and that's, that's, I guess, what I want you to take away. We're gonna get a lot of data here and stats, but I'm, I'm actually not an academic. I am a practitioner and a policymaker. So I'm looking at the connection between how do we take the evidence base and apply it in real life so that we can bring change to our communities. Um, finally, I just want to be really clear, because sometimes people, uh, I get really passionate about extremisms. I just want to say on the upfront, um, your calling uh, as pastors, as lay leaders, that is the higher calling. Um, and it is a difficult calling today, very difficult. So I'm, my goal is to point out the connections between your work and my work so that we can better face these challenges together. But I'm not at all suggesting that the security mission supersedes the calling that you've been given. So can we go to the next slide? Um, we're going to get into some dark stuff. So I want to start with the good news first. I truly do believe that the church is uniquely suited for this moment. Now, I don't mean the American church. I mean... Jesus' church. There is nothing new under the sun. The church, the saints that have gone before us have faced this before. So we have history, we have scripture to guide us in these difficult times. The research on radicalization and extremism has demonstrated that we can build resilience to conspiracies and extremism in communities which will reduce violence. So the end point of all of that you're gonna see here in the next 30 minutes is that you have tools in your toolkit already that can help your community. So I'm not asking you to do something new, I'm just ho hopefully connecting dots for you so you understand why the work we're doing is so important. Next slide. All right, before I can explain our current threat environment, I need to give you a bit of a history lesson um, though I'm looking around the room, and this is not always the case anymore, 
it looks like most of you experienced 9-11. Is that right? <laughs> I was talking to some college students last week and, oh, mind blowing. Um, that would be a little bit different of a, a set of remarks. So um, you probably remember these horrible uh, front pages. I was in DC on that day. If we can go to the next slide. You remember any of these pictures? Anybody remember duct tape being told we needed to buy duct tape for our windows? Yeah. I was working at the White House at that time. Maybe not our finest hour. Um, I joined a small team at the White House, and it was mainly m made up of field operators, um, alphabet soup of security agencies, FBI, CIA, Secret Service, uh, Green Beret. It was um, a bunch of guys who obviously were very proud to serve at the White House, but they would have much rather been in the field. Um, and so our job was to do policy work. They didn't like to write. Um, so I was their policy analyst. I would do their writing for them, and they taught me a lot in the process. So it was kind of a mutually beneficial relationship because um, I've never actually served in the field, but I have had the honor of working with those that do. And in that time frame, right between 9-11 and about 2004, um, before we had some of the new institutions like the National Counterterrorism Center, it was our small team that was responsible for mapping threats in the United States and making sure that the appropriate actions were being taken. You might remember post 9-11, the, the wall was an issue. Uh, the, there was a wall separating the intelligence community and the law enforcement community and information wasn't shared. And that's part of the reason we believe that we didn't detect the threat. Um, so it was our team that was trying to bridge that wall until some of the laws and policies filled in. So we would sit around the conference room table every morning. We would be reviewing each new piece of intel as it came in. We were looking at dots on a map, literally, trying to figure out if we connect these dots, does this indicate a plot is underway? Um, we were very focused on funding, training, operative travel, plans, bomb making material, dry runs, command and control. Um, and so the early days of preventing an attack were very much the mission of the intelligence community, the law enforcement community, and the military. What I want to be able to show you today at a high level is that those tools are stupid. They're very necessary. They have kept us, for the most part, safe. But they are not sufficient for today's threat. Both because we too narrowly defined what prevention should have been in the first place, but also because the nature of the threat is so different today. Back then, we were worried about a complex, coordinated attack. It is something that takes years to plan and it has a heavy footprint so you can detect those dots. Today's attack is not that. Today's attack is primarily lone actors. Today's attack is inspired, not directed. It is a very different threat environment. Next slide, please. So um, before we jump into the nature of the change in the threat, um, I want to give you some brief definitions we have international terrorism, which is what most of us have spent most of our time paying attention to for the last 20 years. So that's your ISIS, your Al Qaeda. Um, most of our counterterrorism counter efforts were focused on the international space. US based individuals who are inspired by international terrorists, terrorism, are called homegrown violent extremists. There are a bunch more laws that can be used if you are inspired by ISIS. On the domestic side, the terrorism meaning is, is pretty much the same between the two, but the domestic terrorism piece of it means ideologies that are not associated with an international terrorist group. We designate international terrorist groups. We do not have a tool to designate domestic terrorist groups. So it's kind of this all other category um, which historically has, there are a couple of key categories and we'll talk about those in a second. I, it's not the best description because what we regard as domestic terrorism is actually quite international. There are neo-Nazi groups here in the United States. There are neo-Nazi groups in Germany. Um, the Christchurch attack that happened in 2019 
uh, was motivated by a great replacement theory, which we saw amplified in the El Paso attack later the same year. So we call it domestic, probably not the right level. It has to do with the way our laws are structured. Next slide. Okay, so let's talk about threat. This graph was adapted from research by the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. You can access it online if you're curious. Um, it shows terrorist attacks and plots going back to 1994, goes through 2021. You'll see two spikes on the graph. Just make sure, yeah, on your left. Um, two spikes, 1995 and 2001. The 95 is the Oklahoma City bombing. 2001 is September 11th. Um, and if you look on that right side of the chart, you start to see a steady uptick in attacks and plots beginning in 2015. That's what I want us to pay attention to, is that what we're experiencing now is not a return, return to the 1990s. It's actually far greater than what we had in the 1990s. Also within the graphic, you're going to see a differentiation between the ideological motivation. And a, a quick caveat, CSIS uses different coding than the U.S. government. U.S. government um, has to be more careful about how it labels ideologies because they are really focused on the violence um, we, because of the First Amendment. They can't police thought. We don't want them to police thought. Um, but academics can get a little bit more into the ideology. So CSIS codes things as far right, far left, religiously motivated, uh, or nationalistic. Um, ethno-nationalist is the correct term. So in the far right category, you're going to have racially and ethically motivated violent extremists, um, anti-government militia. On the far left, you're going to have anarchist violent extremism, ex uh, environmental violent extremism. You're also going to have um, certain, it, it's a little too nuanced to go into, but there are certain categories of racial um, bias that fall into the far left. So with that brief primer, you can see which line is most dominant. It's the far right, blue on the, glass, on the graph. So CSIS concluded the far-right terrorism has significantly outpaced terrorism from other types of perpetrators, including from far-left networks and individuals inspired by Islamic State and Al-Qaeda. And I should have said the religious line is where they code Al-Qaeda and ISIS. So we spent all this time and money focused on Al-Qaeda and ISIS, and yet we have more plots and attacks coming from the far-right. Next slide, please. This is not just academics that have asserted this. Uh, when I was serving in government, we uh, put out statements uh, flagging that this, the threat had changed and we needed to take domestic terrorism more seriously. And you have Director Ray noting that uh, it is the, the domestic violent extremist threat is on par with, if not greater than, ISIS. In fact, in 2022, the FBI was conducting approximately 27 investigations within their d domestic terrorism program. When I was testifying with my FBI counterpart in 2019, that number was at 1,000. Now, a number of those cases, quite a significant number of those cases, are directly tied to January 6th, and they do classify that as a domestic terrorism case. Nevertheless, it's still almost a tripling of caseload in about four or five years. Next slide. Um, I work for a company called Moonshot. As Knapp mentioned, we intervene with individuals online who are radicalizing. Um, we are able to assess the appetite for engaging with harmful content online. Um, and we were able to detect within a few weeks after pandemic measures were set in, um, in April 2020, there had been a 37% increase in attempts to access extremist content. A year later, that had increased even further to 140%. Why might that be? I'm sure you have your gut reactions to why that might be, but um, in general, we know that crises are what extremists thrive on. It's a huge recruitment tool for them. They latch on to uncertainty and they offer black and white solutions for people that are dealing with uncertainty. And it's very appealing for those that are vulnerable. Um, next slide. Just a quick, we're going to go through these pretty quick, Saul. So um, uh, you can go, sorry, you can go back to the, that one, though. 
Um, this is a comparison of HVE. Those are the homegrown violent extremists inspired by ISIS and Al-Qaeda, the number that they've killed um, versus the number of domestic violent extremists killed. And you can see that the number killed on the DVE side is higher. Next slide. I've walked through some of this already, but and if you are interested in learning more about these, we can talk about that at the breakout session. But here are the different categories that the government uses for domestic violent extremism. Next slide. And here are how those categories stack up in terms of number of uh, incidents. Sorry, I always get confused by the incidents and deaths. Um, so you can see that the racially and ethnically motivated extremist bar is the highest and then anti-government extremism. Anti-government extremism in the last two years has been increasing over the racially motivated extremism. And I should be clear in a different setting, different presentation, um, we go into how these categories are really, um, individuals are increasingly taking a little bit from here, a little bit from there. They're, they're not um, as clean as this graph shows. It is uh, increasingly hybrid, increasingly what we call a salad bar ideology, Make, choose your own adventure ideology. And um, so it, it, you, it's hard even if you're the academic coding, oh, this is racially motivated. Well, it might also be anti-government extremist, or it might also be this other um, incel ideology. Next slide. So then it gets even more hard. Um, in 2021, really starting in 2020, we had a different dynamic. We were starting to see unprecedented number of attacks that be, could be actually, sorry, let me back up. In the mid 2010s, we started to have an unprecedented number of targeted violence attacks that didn't have a clear ideology. The one that is the most significant was Las Vegas. That was, it still is the, uh, biggest mass attack that we've had in the United States outside of 9-11 and Oklahoma City, but biggest mass attack um, using a gun and that had no ideology associated with it. So we um, were struggling with how do we try to classify or understand to the American public, this seemed like an act of terrorism, but because there was no ideology, it actually didn't meet the definition of terrorism. And so um, it just kind of felt awkward for us to be uh, splicing definitions um, when it, in fact, it had wreaked terror on that community and for, for all of us that, that watched the aftermath. Um, so we have targeted violence enter the scene, and in 2020, 2021, we have what Robert Pape of the University of Chicago calls mass political violence, with a significant portion of the country that has embraced violence as a solution to their grievances. Um, there are arguments to be made that the definition of mass political violence meets the definition of terrorism. Uh, it does have an ideological motivation. It is about political coercion. I think, my, I personally and, and many um, in the community don't see tremendous value in calling a large group of Americans terrorists. It's likely to further radicalize them. Um, so we, we tend to talk about it in terms of mass political violence. Um, th these stats that you're seeing up behind you are from 2021 to 2022. I have to say I pulled some data fairly recently. It's still, it's still around these levels, um, and it's likely to go up this year. So we have a million Americans who were part of or personally knew a member of a militia or an extremist group. The University of Chicago found that 10% believe that use of force was justified to restore Trump to the presidency. One in three Americans think violence against the government is sometimes justified. 25% of Americans say it's sometimes okay to use violence against the government. And 10% say violence is justified right now. There are polls that go all the way up to 40% of us. Now, here's the good news. Most people can cognitively hold a belief that violence is necessary and will never mobilize to violence. The bad news is it is impossible to know at a macro level who is actually going to mobilize to violence. So if you're law enforcement or security field like me, um, if we take that lower range of 25%, that means about 80 million people are cognitively open to this, the possibility of violence. Um, and 
apparently 33 million of them think the circum circumstances justify violence right now. That number far exceeds what our law enforcement can handle. Anybody know how many law enforcement officers we have in the country? Yeah, it's about seven or 8,000. Not enough. Um, so this kind of leads to, we can go to the next slide, um, a point at which the counterterrorism community is grappling with and what seem to be never ending wars overseas, uh, continued threats from ISIS, growing threats at home. And we have this moment in 2017, 2018, where we're like, can we really say we're winning the war on terror? I mean, it's good that we haven't had another 9-11, but there are more terrorists today than there were in 9-11. So we kind of went to the next obvious answer. We've got to find a way to reduce the number of people that are actually cognitively open to this idea that violence is necessary. And it led us to change our approach. Um, let me define some terms. Let's go to the next slide. This is, this is, this is the definition I use. There's like a hundred different definitions of extremism out there. The U.S. government doesn't have an official one. Um, I think it's really important that we actually do have a definition. Uh, we use the term a lot. It's a contextual term. Uh, things that would have been seen as extreme a hundred years ago are now the norm now. So when I talk about extremism, for me, that definition is inherently tied to a hostile action. But notice that what you have in here is the first part of it is polariz polarization. It's the idea that your in-group success or survival. So by the way, you've defined an in-group and you've kind of set aside an out-group who's posing a threat to your success or survival. So your in-group success or survival is being threatened by that out-group. You can stop right there. That's our politics. That's every election cycle right? Success or survival, it's the biggest election of our lifetime. This is an existential threat for our country. Pastors are going to get thrown in jail. I'm not making that up. That's what I was told. I was, in, I was in the pews. I believed it. Existential threat, our success or survival because of that outbreak. Therefore, this is where it gets extremist. Hostile action is necessary. Now, here's the problem. In conservative politics, which is where I came from, we've been using terms that indicate certain types of hostile action, I don't know, for several decades at least. And then it became a little bit more acceptable for us to actually act on that hostile action. Now, when I describe hostile action, the, the um, academic here, Berger, um, he describes a spectrum on the Extreme end is genocide, and then you get to terrorism, then you get to hate crimes, violence. Okay, that's all criminal behavior. The government can do something about that. But before you get there, the lower end is intimidation, harassment, vandalism. That's criminal, but it's hard to prosecute and approve. So that lower end of the spectrum is much harder for and really shouldn't be the government's job. That is civil society's job. It's resetting of norms to say, this is not how we're going to treat one another. And that's what I think the work that we're trying to do here today is needs to be focused on is we need to push people back from that lower end of the hostile action spectrum because the evidence tells us once you st take that step onto that pathway, again, we never know, and it's a small amount that mobilize, but it is, it is a step into that violent pathway. All right, um, a couple of other points on this slide. Why do people radicalize? It's not the ideology. People that exit extremism will tell you it wasn't about the ideology. So when you're confronting somebody or in a relationship with somebody that you think is radicalizing, you know what doesn't work? trying to argue about the ideology. <clears throat> this is a very simplistic graph of kind of what we've already talked through. Um, and, but here's the takeaway I want you to have is that vulnerable and at-risk population is so large right now. We need help. The government can only do that radicalized, 
uh, possibly violent individuals, ba barely. Um, different conversation. We're doing some interesting work in that space. But uh, really, the government's role is mobilization to violence and attempted attacks. But we really need, if you'll go to the next slide, you'll see very quickly um, that primary prevention space where it says community resilience and risk factors. That's what we need help with. That's what I need your help with. Let's go to the next slide. Um, we have been studying this for 20 years, 20 plus years. So we have a strong evidence base at this point as to why people radicalize, what you can do to intervene at different steps along that graph I just showed you. But also we know that individuals that commit attacks were overwhelmingly observed by people that love them as having some sort of behavior change indicative of an attack being planned. And so the other thing that we need help with is we need the community to be better educated on what those behavioral indicators are and to know that it's not an act of betrayal to reach out and ask for help for that person. Part of what I do in my day job is we're trying to set up alternatives to law enforcement to do this intervention because law enforcement intervention has not demonstrated to be very effective. We need them. If you got to arrest somebody and throw them in jail so that the attack doesn't happen, great. But we would much rather intervene earlier. And in order to do that earlier intervention, we need bystanders to be reporting. Next slide, please. In this last piece, I, I uh, wanted to point out early in the post 9-11 period, radicalization predominantly occurred in person. You were recruited in person. You were sent to a training camp. You were indoctrinated over a period of years. Now, and you can see it in the period 2011 to 2016 with social media, smartphones became the norm. It almost completely inverses, and today it's almost 100%. People are exposed initially to ideology. In fact, most of you have been exposed to extremist ideology at this point. You probably don't know it. Uh, but it is that prolific and in the mainstream at this point. So it's that exposure and that pull of the network that happens predominantly online, occasionally some offline contact. Next slide. And we're going to skip this slide. Let's see. Um, I wanted to connect to this uh, a topic that we can discuss more. I know Dan is going to um, touch on this in his breakout session. Um, but people often don't see the connection between, like, why does disinformation matter as it pertains to violence? It is the a recruiting tool that extremists use. So extremists use conspiracy theories to create, to undermine trust in institutions, to create doubt, and to offer solutions, to offer, like, I have the black and white answer, I have the certainty you need, and in doing so, they're creating that pathway to violence. So disinformation, um, living in, I think, uh, the, the, uh, the phrase of um, a lack of, of truth or lack of, uh, or post-truth society, lack of information integrity actually is probably one of the primary reasons why we have more violence today. Next slide. And just um, another note, because I, this really bothers me. We have teachers, law enforcement officers, and election officials who are being threatened their kids, they get phone calls saying that they're going to track their kids down. They say, I know where your kid goes to school or your grandkid. It's horrific. Now, most of these get investigated and the people that are placing the calls, they weren't really going to do anything. But do you want to volunteer for your community for a job that probably is pays nothing or very little? knowing that you're gonna get threatened because somebody thinks that you stole the election. Um, one of the things I think the church can do, very small, is just reach out to the people that serve our community and say thank you. Just as pastors are going through a really difficult season, these public servants are also going through a very difficult season and letting them know that, you know, we might not agree with you on certain policy matters, that doesn't matter, you're still a human being. You're serving my community. You're taking care of my kids. Thank you. Next slide. 
and we'll go to the next slide. So I'm going to wrap up here and we're going to have brainstorm session um, or breakout session. I'm going to do some brainstorming too. Um, but I wanted to kind of leave you with this so that when we go into those breakout sessions, we can have a little bit um, of a conversation of what do we do about this? Um, part of that 2017, 2018 shift about we've got to be working more upstream when people before people radicalize or early in the radicalization process. Uh, we developed this public health model of prevention. Um, so simple way to think about it in public health, your primary prevention mechanisms are you go to your doctor for annual physicals and you get vaccines or some people might not, but you know, it's a, uh, you're trying to prevent illness and disease. You're exercising, you're sleeping well, you're doing uh, a proper diet. Those are all primary prevention mechanisms. Secondary is where you end up with an early detection of disease. So you get your mammogram or your colonoscopy so that we can catch it early, so that we can treat it and you have better outcomes. Tertiary is when you've been diagnosed with stage four it is much more difficult to treat. Outcomes are um, not as good. In the prevention space, what we need to do in that primary space is build resilience and protective factors. In that secondary space, which is what my company works on, we're intervening with individuals and we're trying to offer them psychosocial support to help them off that pathway of violence. And that tertiary space is the criminal justice space. Next slide. So this is the fun part, ready? Remember I told you we were, we've done a lot of studies on why people radicalize and that it's not ideology. There are over 100 factors that have been identified in individuals that have joined terrorist groups or committed mass attacks. Good news, there are some that kind of surface up at the top. You don't have to memorize all 100. It is a need for significance. It is a need for belonging. Usually individuals that commit attacks have had some sort of life crisis in the last six to 12 months. And lacking a strong attachment or community, lacking belonging, lacking some healthy protective factors. Their way of coping is they get online, they radicalized, and they mobilized violence. So what does that mean for us? I, I think when I look at this, satisfying the need for significance and belonging, having a nuanced understanding where you don't see everything as black and white. Teachings about, <laughs> we just actually taught the full text of scripture, what Jesus' direction is to us. It was just in Matthew 5 this morning. Super hard passage. To turn the other cheek. To not retaliate. But that is our call. That is the revolutionary call of the gospel. Strong ties to community. Positive, realistic future goals. I mean, look, these are written in psychological, sociological terminology, but Jesus wrote this down for us thousands of years ago. There is nothing new under the sun. So we have the answers. You in this room are much better equipped than I am to actually implement, but it is, I hope you see, super important that you do it. That the work you're doing is not, yes, it is about that soul, but it's also about creating a flourishing community. And by having those strong bonds of community, by the way, that belonging piece, we're such an isolated society today. We are so lonely. Creating flourishing communities will move us back on the path of peace.